Welcome to Motivated to Lead podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Quangsign. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're happy to have join us Andy Bass. Andy is uh, based in the UK. Uh, He's a consultant, author, and speaker who works with businesses to find and exploit their hidden assets. Uh, He's worked with uh, organizations in the UK, US, and Far East. And uh, prior to his consulting career, he was a lecturer uh, at uh, several business schools, and uh, he has written a book entitled Start With What Works, A Faster Way to Grow Your Business, as well as some other uh, books that he's written. Uh, We're going to be discussing uh, some of the the concepts from that book and uh, looking forward to today's conversation with Andy. Well, can you give our audience just a little bit of your story, a little bit of your background and how you've gotten to where you are today? Yeah, yes, uh, of course. So I I work with businesses to help them to find their hidden resources, essentially. I've always found that going into clients, they so often had the answers already. And could we help them to find these things that they've already kind of paid for and they've already got on staff? And uh, the the journey into that starts, I guess, um, finding myself at college, not doing what I'd originally expected. I was going to be a dentist, you know. Ah. (laughs) Uh, and uh, for one reason or another, I ended up doing completely differently computer science and what we call over here anyway, ergonomics, which I guess you guys would probably know as human factors. So um, the application of, of human sciences to technology, and it was a great time to be doing both computing and ergonomics because people would, you know, Apple Macs were fairly new and sure. people were very interested in that interaction between the two things. So I, I did a PhD in computer science. Uh, and then uh, found myself teaching psychology and AI in a business school for a few years. Um, we might come back to what I learned there because I think that's important in terms of the work I do now. Uh, but then I kind of felt I want to know whether the things we're teaching really work. Hmm. Like, do they really work for clients? So sure. I and, and, a, and a friend of mine who was more of the salesman, if you like, we uh, we started consulting. We started going out trying to find clients and help them. And this is back 25 years, I guess now. Um, and since then, uh, Paul, my business partner at the time, I always say we used to be business partners, but now we're friends again. Uh, <laughs> he, he decided to do something else. Right. I've carried on with the consulting, I worked with some sure. great companies and um, some some large ones that put, you know famous names. And and but also where I find my real sweet spot is kind of mid size. B2B, um, yeah. doing packaging or in the automotive supply chain. Or I especially enjoy businesses where they're using a, a lot of science technology uh, and and contributing then to 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 the end manufacturer. And I find the things that go on in, in, in those businesses particularly fascinating. Yeah, well, I would definitely want to to talk about your kind of your work and some of the lessons that you've learned. A lot of our listeners are uh, first time leaders, first time right. CEOs, okay. and uh, so we're uh, definitely loved your insights and, and encourage people. I, I've read your "Start with What Works" book, and we want to talk about that. and And uh, you have some other books too that you've written, and and we we definitely uh, would love to uh, to hear kind of how you think around business and right. resources. And I think it will be definitely be helpful to to those listening. Um, we're, we're living in a world where there's a lot of rapid change and the pace is, seems to, I think the pace has picked up, uh, at least it feels yeah. like in the last couple of years with AI and all that that's going on. But um, talk about as a leader, how to see things differently. You, you talk about that with uh, Start With Works, but talk a little bit about that of, you know, that perspective or that lens that uh sure that okay so i i think like to connect my work to the trends that you're you're talking about i mean even if, if we'd been speaking four or five years ago you could have just said what you've just said how fast mm-hmm. the world is and it seems fast sure and then since then we've had the pandemic and we've got the yeah. wars and so on and so forth so you know there's a there's a, a principle different people have said it uh different ways that if your if your rate of learning isn't as fast as the rate of change then you're in trouble so you've got to learn more quickly and what does that mean by learning i don't think it means like sending people off to business school to learn more theories i think what it means is learning to see the world 
the outside world in new ways, but also to see what you've already got in new ways. And um, I said to at the top that I would go into clients and see how often they already had the answers and they're not and they're not noticing them. So for me, becoming very sensitized to your underappreciated, overlooked assets, resources, know-how that you can reconfigure quickly to meet the challenges as your customers needs change or uh, you know as your supply chain maybe needs to change and so on so it's it's about almost and this is where the computer science mind comes in understanding your business in kind of modular terms and then seeing that those modules can be used in different ways we can get into like how do you find those and how you plug them together uh, as we go along i saw one of your talks where you gave a visual of taking different parts from different uh industries and how somebody came up with connecting those ideas to come up with uh, uh, you know a product or service talk about just some of the real life examples that you've seen where uh, companies have kind of taken a look at kind of what their assets are and uh, coming up with something that you know they already had but they didn't realize it yeah yeah okay and and I think the diagram you're talking about uh, is probably the uber example everybody knows about right. uber Interesting thing about Uber is that all of the technologies they used already existed, mm -hmm. right? And yet they still disrupted a global industry. So this is not a council of a lack of ambition that you you use the stuff you already got. This is saying you can actually do a, a heck of a lot by by rethinking. So Uber is a great example because they already there was already GPS, there was already like trust pilot type ratings. They're obviously already taxis. Uh, so you put those things and smartphones. Um, some of the examples that I like to talk about, one, and I'll try and give a range like the, the, the very different. So one would be Amazon Web Services. If you think about that, they did something that a lot of businesses can do, which is they went, they started out as a bookstore store, and then they realized, hey, anything that we could list on our website that we can deliver through the mail, we could sell. So that was the first level of realizing, right? Sure. But then they went... Hey, all the technology we've built to be able to run this business, that technology could be provided, the, the cloud technology, that could be provided to other people. And that became Amazon Web Services, which was not a business that was originally envisaged, but actually is the most profitable bit. In fact, for a long time, it was the only bit of Amazon that even made money. And and and, and to give you a non-digital example, because people sometimes will say, well, okay, you know, that's that's a that's a, a digital one. Think of Lotus Cars, right? Storied sports car manufacturer um they were building racing cars and sports cars and as a as a side effect of doing that they developed an ability to build and understand automotive suspension systems they then took that and started to consult with the big major car manufacturers and that's about half their business and mm. the, the two work together beautifully so that's the sort of idea that there could be all kinds of things that you're doing that have that have value. And I have a set of questions that you can start to ask yourself to find and uncover these things. I was uh, interviewing someone from uh, used to be uh, uh, head of uh, marketing in a, in a division of, uh, of Lego. And uh, there, she was talking about the innovation that took place there. And I think you have a story around Legos. One of the pieces that they were missing kind of, as they were thinking about kind of their market, uh, can you relay that story, kind of how they've... Uh... Yeah, Lego's really interesting for a lot of reasons. One of them is that, you know, I, I talk in the book, how do we miss... You know, here's me talking about, oh, you've got hidden resources. Very interesting, how do we miss those resources? And there are various ways that we do that. But one of them is to, because we have a belief, a very fixed belief. Now, Lego, they had a fixed belief. And then we're talking about the sort of the end of the 90s now that Lego was for kids. And so if the fact that adults loved Lego and that there was a sizable self-organized Lego adult community who could potentially be a great resource because they can spend sure. more money and they can tell you what Lego kits are cool. They deliberately ignored those because there was this belief, no, we're for kids. It's, adults have no business playing with Lego, right? Now, when the new CEO came in, Jürgen Vidnusdorp came in and really turned Lego around and that you've seen Lego so well in, 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 in this century, um, one of the things they said was let's embrace it, what they call the adult fans of Lego. And, and so it's a beautiful example of how, of another hidden asset, in this case, a, a, an underserved customer base, uh, was actually deliberately ignored. Mm. 
So when you, you talk about the hidden assets, and uh, my work is around uh, putting teams together and helping companies with talent, um, talk a little bit about that, the hidden assets of that can be people within the organization yeah. that you maybe are not tapping into. And, and uh, as first-time leaders, they typically inherit teams and maybe don't have the right people in the right spots. But uh, any thoughts around that as far as how it relates to people? Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because you know there's that cliche, people are our greatest resource. Sure. And you yeah. look at the ways that companies actually treat their people, and it's not always kind of consistent with that. Mm. Um, in a way, I guess what I'm saying, and I'm going to guess what you say as well, Mark, is is that that cliche is true, right? And that again, it's our reasons for why do we kind of neglect that. Um, I would say the first line leaders look. Uh, it's easier now still to stay in touch with the front line. As you become more senior, you maybe find yourself becoming more distant from them. Until you get to be CEO and you hardly ever speak to someone on the shop floor, you hardly ever speak to somebody on the, on the loading dock or somebody who's take, on the phone, you're spending all your time looking at spreadsheets and talking to bankers and your CFO. And I think that the best leaders, uh, they they always make sure to stay in touch with what's going on, on the ground level, if you like. Um, so I think that's the single biggest, the single biggest thing. Uh, there's lots of other interesting issues that, you know, that you, you talked about in terms of what do you do with the, if you've got a person in the wrong place and so on. But I would say really just to take that idea uh, of, of that people are our greatest resource very seriously and engage them in the kind of thinking that I'm talking about. I could just, I could just give you a, a very quick example, um, sure. of I'm not a factory operations guy. Right. So I don't do the six. I'm conversant with Six Sigma, but I'm not right. I've not got my green belt even, let alone my black belt. But I have done some factory improvement. And the way that we did it was to really take this idea seriously and say to people on the shop floor, you know, the plant better than anybody. How do we improve it? And as long as you set that up right and make the management feel comfortable, which is the trick. Um you, we saw, you know, we've seen on-time delivery improve, quality improve, accidents come down, all that sort of hard measures through taking that idea seriously about the people that you that you want to follow you. You talk about, uh, in your uh, start with what works, I believe, about profit amplification. Uh, talk a little bit about that and just that that whole idea as far as around that and, and uh, yeah. how, how somebody can take a look differently at that well you know the 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 essence of profit what i mean by that profit uh, amplification is that the value to the customer or the client goes up more quickly than the additional cost of resources that you're adding i need to give example to make this concrete yeah but that's the idea so you've got to think about value from the customer's point of view again almost a cliche mark but how many people really take it that seriously let me give you the example that is in the foreword of the book. I didn't write it, but it's it's by a guy called Rory Sutherland, who is a is a maybe the most influential British advertising uh, guy, and I think increasingly around the world, a wonderful, wonderful man. And he was telling a story about a, a woman in Africa. She was trying to support herself. She was supporting herself, selling hard boiled eggs to construction workers for lunch. And what she discovered was that if she cut the egg in half, put in a tomato and some leaves and some herbs, now it wasn't a hard boiled egg anymore. It was lunch. And the difference between a hard boiled egg and lunch was she could charge twice as much for lunch than she could for the hard boiled egg. And it didn't cost her anywhere near twice as much to put that on. That's the amplification. And it's realizing that lunch has more value than an egg. Um, do you want a big business example? Because obviously that's sure. a bit folksy. Um, <laughs> uh, the principle's the same. So Cardinal Health, you know, a big health services provider, right. they did the same sort of thing. They were in a surgical, in one way, they were they were in the surgical instrument business and it's a commodity, right? There were a couple of competitors who could easily match their, their price and quality. They were going to get out of that business. Instead of doing that, what they did was they went and looked at surgical teams using their stuff and they watched the way that nurses were spending all their time managing stock and getting things ready for the operations rather than nursing. And they said, why don't we put kits together, get some top surgeons, figure out what you need for standard procedures, 
use just-in-time ordering. We're very good at that kind of thing. We're very, we, have, we have expertise on computing, ordering systems and distribution and just because they did drug distribution, they can get drugs to people quickly, all that. Use all of those tools and sell surgical kits. They're called pre-source. And um, it catapulted them out of that trap of being in a commodity. And uh, again, the amplification is there because everybody benefits, but the cost of doing it was not as much mm. as the value that was created. There was a synergy. I think a lot of companies talk about innovation. We want to be innovative. I was just having yeah. a conversation with yeah. a CEO of a company uh, last week, and and that was the the thing that they were they said we need an innovation leader. But I think a lot of times it's the the new idea that that they're looking for versus you know something that you probably you talk about the hidden assets within the company. But as a leader thinking innovatively, um, what what advice would you give somebody as they're, you know, I think you talk about letting the world teach you what works and ar around innovation. Talk talk a little bit of your thoughts right. around that. Well, I'm very influenced in that by the lean startup movement, which mm -hmm. I guess uh, people would know Eric Reese's book, Lean Startup. If, if you don't, then it's well worth looking at it. Now, that that is standard now in startup world and there are some big companies that have used it the essential this is where the language of minimum viable product and pivot comes but like a lot of things once they become jargon people sure. kind of forget you know the, yep. exactly the meaning the 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 i think on innovation i'd say a couple of things i'd say um getting your people to think about themselves to start thinking what are our hidden assets in and of itself produces innovative ideas that are potentially more feasible for you because they're based in things that you've already got rather than for example pulling something in like some flash of uh, out of the blue so sure. i think you've got more chance of finding something that genuinely meets your customers needs if you build on things that you're already doing and then the whole to let the world teach you what works lean startup idea is that you figure out what has to be true for that business idea to work and you test that assumption. So the classic example or a classic example is um, two companies, Webvan, uh, which was one of these dot com darlings, Webvan.com, which is online groceries versus Zappos shoes. So just very briefly, Webvan raised a huge amount of money, $800 million, I think, from Sequoia Capital and people like that. Clever people, they had a beautiful business plan, they did market research, people will buy their groceries online. This is the year 2000. Well, guess what? They said they would and they didn't, uh. right? Because what people tell you they'll do versus what they actually do are two different things. What Zappos did was they went to their local shoe shop, they took photos of the shoes, they put them on a website. If anybody ordered the shoes, they went to the shoe shop, bought them at retail, took them round to the person's house. By doing that, they 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 validated the assumption on which the whole business depends, which is will people order shoes they haven't tried on? And there's a whole load of assumptions, but that's the first one. Because if sure. people won't yeah. order shoes, then there's no business. And so right. I think let the world teach you rather than letting people tell you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, talk about your your uh, your books that you've you've written. And, and again, kind of for, for somebody who's a new leader, kind of the, the premise of it, I would love yeah. to, uh, to, to hear kind of. Well, uh, yeah, uh, sure. So I've written three and a half books, if you like, cause I, I co-authored one. There's a one ages ago called the performance papers, which is a bit dated in some ways, like the examples are old, but there's some great stuff in there for, uh, for new leaders. Cause it talks about leadership and strategy and teams and what will change in management or what won't. And I think that stuff stands up. The The two most recent ones we talked about start with what works. The other that I just uh, wrote last year is called Committed Action. Very relevant, I think, for, for, for any leader, because it's about how do you gain the commitment of people? And I have a little formula in there called the CEO formula, which is uh, uh, foster curiosity, invite curiosity, that's the C. Encourage exploration, which is the E, and then transfer ownership, which is the O. And I give examples of how that works. The best single example I can give uh, is uh, Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society. So if you want to know how to engage people, go back and watch Dead Poets Society, and you'll see that he does things to, first of all, to get them curious, 
then he gets them exploring and then he transfers ownership they they create their own their own poetry society mm. and in the book i kind of break that down but it's that you get it's those three steps so uh that's what that's what committed actions about great well tell me with i know you probably uh are continuing to to learn and to to grow as far as in, any additional books that you you've read in the last uh, couple of years that you think uh, would be helpful for for our audience to to put on their reading list yeah sure well uh we, you said Anne, Anne Latham was on recently yes correct just as very kindly so her book the power of clarity is a tremendously mm. good book because it's so easy for people to think they're talking understanding each other and be talking at cross purposes the way language can kind of trip us up so uh, and i guess they can check your podcast out <laughs> with sure. Anne. so that's a great book uh, i think lean startup if you don't know that stuff is i'm a big eric reese fan um i also really like something a bit more almost like philosophical uh, I like Nassim Taleb's stuff a lot, the guy that wrote The Black Swan and so on. Mm. I think if you want to think about, uh, think strategically, uh, you have to think about how do you deal with a world you can't predict? And you were saying earlier on, the world changes really fast. And Taleb is very good on how do we make sure that we're most likely to be ready for things that we can't predict? And mm. how can we position ourselves and our, our bets, if you like, as we, we're all taking bets, whether you're the CEO or whether you're thinking about what to do in your own career. So I would recommend any of his stuff. Anti-fragile, I think, is probably the one I'd point people to. So what, what do you do outside of work uh, to recharge? Well, it's funny, actually, because today is a, is a very auspicious day in that regard. I, do, I play the guitar. I play in a rock band. Okay. Um, but I, I I describe myself sometimes as a failed stand-up comedian, and uh, ah. <laughs> the main I, I, the main problem having been that I wasn't funny that was the problem. <laughs> but I did a course uh, fifteen years ago, and then after that I did some gigs, and I did yeah okay right. I had some wins and some losses, but tonight for fun uh, I'm going back on stand-up comedy course with the same teacher for a kind of a refresher and, and so on. So I will probably, we do seven weeks and there's a showcase at the end. Uh -huh. If that goes okay, I might I might do some open mics and stuff again around Birmingham. Uh -huh. uh, the world's opened up again and, you know. <laughs> uh, I think you're the, are the first guest that uh, we've had on that does stand-up comedy, at least that right. I know, I'm aware of. So that's right. that's great. Um, what, what parting advice would you give uh, a new leader uh, that that you think would be be helpful well i think i go back to what we said like the the stay in touch with the front line mm. and don't get too impressed with being a manager and a leader and all this kind of stuff and 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 uh because a lot of that is uh frankly bs and if you look at if, you, if you're in, if you're ambitious um the best companies uh the leaders are close to the action and you watch some disasters and you'll see it's when the leaders lost touch. So I would, I would mm. say that was my number one is stay in touch with the actual work and, and the people that do it. Yeah. Great. Great advice. So how would someone learn more about uh, your work and your books? Yeah. So, uh, I, I think the best thing to do would be to go to my website. Can we stick the link in, uh, in uh, the notes and yep, you can, absolutely. they can download their free chapters of the books. And so they can, they can get everything from there. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to reading your other books. Uh, I definitely enjoyed Start With What Works and uh, wish Thanks you continued much. success in all that uh, you're doing. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.